I want to welcome you guys to the very first Bible study of 2022, and I am just so excited to get off on this Bible study, get off on this journey. And I'm going to start us with a word of prayer so I don't forget that, and we're going to jump in tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather and to come and to learn and to study and to grow as we look into your word. I pray tonight that as we look at Job, that you open our eyes, open our hearts, open our thoughts, and open our minds so that we can understand a little bit more about you and about how you would have us live. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start tonight with a couple of housekeeping things because it's going to be a little bit different than any other time. And some of you guys might not have ever heard me in a Bible study before. So this year, the church, the entire church is going through one single story. The idea here is that as a church, we want to read through the Bible chronologically from Genesis to Revelation. It's fun and it's interesting and it's life changing to do that. But here's what I know. It's really exciting for about the first three and a half days when you're reading Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. And then when you hit Job, it gets a little bit harder. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands because I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But it gets a little bit harder to maintain and to keep going through, chew through Job every single day. And the, particularly in the Old Testament, there's so many things when we're reading through it in a year, three or four chapters a day, we come to. And the culture is different. The language is different. The situations are different. It's easy for us to get overwhelmed by all of the things that are new and strange. And so I want to try to, I want to do something. So starting next week, I want to actually start each Bible study with sort of a Q&A time. Um, I've been teaching on a fairly, pretty much on a weekly basis for 15 years, so I'm virtually guaranteed not to get a question. Nobody's going to ask me something that's going to totally surprise me. Now that I say that, I'm going to get a question I've never considered before. But it's going to be hard for you to ask me something that's really going to rattle me. And so I want to open it up that anything you've read over the last week or two, if it sticks with you and it's uncomfortable or it's weird or you just don't understand, bring it with you. And I want to tackle that Q&A together. Reading the Bible is incredible and it's fun and it's exciting, but particularly here as we get into, uh, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it's strange. And sometimes we're tempted to get overwhelmed with some of the things that we don't normally read. So I want to open that up to you. We'll start that next week. Um, and so keep that with you. Now I want to start tonight. We're going to be in the book of Job, but I want to start with a big picture question. The question is what, I want to start with tonight, is what is the Bible? In churches, we do a really good job of telling people that you need to read the Bible. We read from the Bible in church. We sing passages from the Bible. Pastors preach from the Bible. But one thing that because the Bible is so sort of in our lives in the church world, we very rarely stop to think, well, what is it in the first place? How do we think about the Bible? How do we understand the Bible? The Bible is, and the theme of this year is one single story, because although the Bible is 66 different books, we need, as Christians, to look at it as one story. The hard part is that this story transcends languages. It's written in Hebrew and Greek and a, and a smidgen of Aramaic. It transcends two testaments, two radically different cultures. When the story of the, the Bible begins, it begins with creation, and, and then there's, there's Israel, and then there's Egypt, and there's Babylon, and then there's Assyria, and then there's a 400-year period between the Old and the New Testament. And when we start in the New Testament, the Romans have conquered, right? Wildly different cultures are represented, and wildly different perspectives are, are represented. So I want to start the very first Bible study of this year, of this uh, one single story study, with a, a quick overview of, of what I think the Bible is and how I'm going to frame our understanding of the Bible throughout this study. It involves three things. And, 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 and my, in my notes, I wrote it down or I typed it down so that I get it right. The Bible is, one, the chronicle of God's activity, the story of God's activity. Number two, through his people, for the world. It is the story or the chronicle of God's activity through his people for the world. What do I mean by that? The first thing we have to understand is that the, the main character in the Bible from Genesis through Revelation is God. 
You have, we'll, we'll come through and we'll meet all, cool, all kinds, all manners of interesting characters and interesting stories. But the Bible is, at its very core, the story of God's activity. He's the protagonist. He's the author. He's the beginner. It is not a story that's about us. It's not even a story that's about Israel. It's a story that is about God. He is the focus of the story. So when we talk about this, our focus always is going to be what is God's role in any given situation. God is the centerpiece of the Bible. He is the author of the Bible. He is the protagonist. He is the, the, the one about whom the Bible is about. Number two, it is the activity through is the activity of God through his people. The Bible has a very specific viewpoint. The thing that makes the Old Testament weird to us, it has a very specific cultural view. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, Genesis 37, which is a story where Judah uh, is tricked by his daughter-in-law Tamar into sleeping with him because he won't marry her off to another son. It's my favorite story in the Old Testament. It's it's amazing. I, I read it at, at its Shakespearean level drama. But the thought of the, the thought of a daughter-in-law tricking her father-in-law into sleeping with her because her father-in-law won't marry her off to another son is wildly inappropriate in our culture. Like that won't happen. The Bible is written in a cultural context with a cultural view, and it's specifically the view from the Israelite community in the Old Testament. And so it's a story of God's activity in and through Israel. In the New Testament, it's the same thing, although we don't have the nation of Israel. We don't have a culture. It's about the people of God, which have been called through Christ. It's the same concept, a slightly different application. In the New Testament, it is about the activity of God in Jesus and in his death and resurrection and in his calling of the early church to go out and to spread the message of the coming of Christ. And it is about how God establishes this new people, the Christian church, as his people. Not to replace Israel, but as a continuation of that theme. So the Bible itself is a chronicle of God's activity, through a peculiar people, for the world. Now, my favorite passage in all of scripture is Genesis 1 through 11. And we're not going to teach on any of that during this Bible study because we're already in the book of Job. The story of Israel, though, begins in Genesis 12 with the call of Abram, which many of you probably read within the last week. From the very beginning, when God calls Abram, he promises that the entire world will be blessed through Abram and his descendants. Although God is primarily focused on working through a specific people, his vision from the very beginning of Israel's story is the entire world. The key here, though, he doesn't work through the entire world. He works through Israel for the world. So this is the overarching theme that we're talking about, the overarching uh, the idea that I carry in the back of my mind whenever I read the Bible. It's, it's the chronicle of God's activity through Israel for the world. And this, th these are the three key components because it is all about God. It comes from the perspective of Israel about their call to bless the whole world. We will find time and time and time again throughout this study that Israel and, and, and even the early church will fail at that. And that's sort of the point. So, unless anybody has any questions, we can jump into the book of Job. All right, we're talking about Job 21 tonight. Job is a book that I genuinely love, but I'm weird. Of everybody in this room, I'm probably the only one who thinks, yes, Job, that's a great book. Right? Unless you love to cry. Here's the thing about Job. Job is hard. It's sad and it's dreary. It's confusing. And most of all, it is mind-numbingly repetitive. Do you, maybe about chapter 20 or 30, did you think to yourself, haven't they said this 17 different ways already? Why in the world do they need to say it again? Here's the thing about Job. 
Job is the most philosophical book in the Bible. Now, Job was part of a section of, of, the, of the Old Testament called the wisdom literature. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, these are classified as wisdom literature. Now, here's the thing about Job. I, I, there, I was reading a book on the Old Testament by an Old Testament scholar named Walter Berugaman about a decade or so ago. And, he, and I'm not going to quote him exactly because I don't remember the quote in detail, but he called Job the great protest to the book of Proverbs. Here's what I mean. If we go to Proverbs chapter 2, or chapter 3, excuse me, Proverbs is obviously a book about how to live well. The assumption of the book of Proverbs is that if you are a decent person, an honorable person, a righteous person, uh, a holy person, and you make good choices, good things will happen to you. Job, 2, or Job chapter 3, verse 25 and 26 says this, You need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked, for the Lord is your security. He will keep your foot from being caught in a trap. That doesn't jive particularly well with the story of Job, does it? In verse 33, it says, The Lord curses the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the upright. Here's the, here's the thing, and here's why Walter Brueggemann called Job the protest against Proverbs. It's not that Proverbs is wrong, and it's not that Job is wrong, and it's not that the Bible is arguing against itself, but Proverbs tells us how to live well. We know, and this is a, this is a, a rule, a worldview by which we all tend to live. If we make good decisions, we expect good things to happen. Right? If we make bad decisions, we expect bad things to happen. The entire world operates on a sort of a basic assumption that good people who make good decisions have good things happen to him and them and bad things, bad people who make bad decisions have bad things happen. And, and I'm using this, 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 this term, good people and bad people, and I know it, it, it's wrong. There's no such thing as a good person and a bad person theologically, and it's sort of nails on a chalkboard to me to say that, and I, I get it because it's not true, but good decisions bring good results, bad decisions bring bad results. And the book of Proverbs is there to say, here are the types of decisions and the type of way you should live your life so that you can have good results. Here's the thing about Job. He did all of that. He didn't stiff people in business transactions. He didn't go around stomping on people trying to get ahead. Job is the picture of righteousness. Right? It, Job is so concerned about personal holiness that when his kids have dinner away from him, if he makes a sacrifice the next day so that in case they might have sinned, he can cover them. Right? That's really righteous. The book of Job tells a story of a man who made all the right decisions, did all the right things, and yet everything fell apart. And here's the thing about this worldview that we all share. We know that just because we make right decisions and do the right things doesn't guarantee us that good things will always happen. Now, we've all, many of us, I have, I know exactly when that idea broke for me. My whole life I was told, go to college and you'll get a decent job and you'll set yourself up for success. And I, my wife and I went to college, we studied, we got really good grades, we worked really hard, and we graduated in 2009 when the economy was at its absolute lowest. I remember applying as a fresh college graduate to jobs all over the country and entry level positions were demanding 10 years of industry relevant experience to get a $25,000 a year opening job. I didn't make a bad decision to go to college. I didn't do something wrong by graduating in the midst of the worst part of the depression. I didn't do something wrong by happening to be in the graduating class that was the worst graduating class in 30 years. 
It just was a fluke. Things happened that were completely outside of my control. And even though I did the right thing and I studied hard and I got good grades and, and I got married, I did all of those things right, things completely out of my control wrecked us financially. Within four months of graduating college, we were in Ohio working and, and we had no money. We were broke and we, we couldn't get a decent job. We couldn't pay our bills. We were just loading up on credit cards just to pay groceries. It's not because we were unrighteous. It's not because we were, we were abusing others. It was just a situation. We all at some point in our life run into a situation where our expectations of how the world ought to work do good things, get good results, do bad things, get bad results, is broken because we've done everything right and the terrible results follow. Job is a story about a man who has spent his life living good, living right, and everything has been good for him for a long time. Healthy family, good kids, good career, good business. He's got sheep and goats and everything you could ever want in his culture, and yet one day... Everything falls apart. In that way, Job is not merely a sob story, but it is the universal story of how every one of us discovers the unsavory, uncomfortable truth of this world. And Job stands where we stand when our life falls apart. And that sometimes, some ways, that makes us makes the story even more uncomfortable. And the thing is that we share this outlook that good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. Job shared that outlook and his friends shared that outlook. The crazy part about the book of Job is that everybody in the book of Job shares the exact same worldview. Good things happen to people who do good things. Bad things happen to do people who do bad things. So when Job's life is completely destroyed and his three friends, and then the later fourth one shows up, come in and they sit down and then they start running in and running their mouths because they believe they know exactly how the world works. Their constant chorus is, well, you know, God is just and good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And so even if you don't admit it, you did something to make this happen. The tricky part about Job's friends is most of the time they would have been right. In another circumstance, they would have been entirely justified potentially in saying that. Right? We've all seen somebody have a crisis in their life that was completely unavoidable, un uh, except for the fact that they made some terrible decisions leading up to that moment. But Job's friends assume what we assume and so they assume that Job has done something to deserve the calamity. Job himself follows the same worldview. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Except I didn't do anything wrong. So Job and his friends are between a rock and a hard place. Job won't give in because he knows he's done nothing to deserve losing everything that he loves. And his friends won't budge because they know this is how the world works. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And this is why the book takes so long to spin out. Because just as every couple who's been married more than two weeks knows, when both sides dig their heels in and they're not going to give in, they will spin that argument again and again and again. And when you fall asleep, you fall asleep coming up with new arguments that you're going to throw at them the next morning over breakfast. Not that anybody knows how our house works. When you get entrenched, you refuse to recognize the other's point. Job's suffering is twofold. He's lost everything. His family, his career, his business, his house, everything. But also, Job has no idea why. He can't comprehend why. Because his worldview says good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. It is this that sets up the stage for the passage that we're going to talk about tonight in Job chapter 21. 
You see, they're trying to work through this scenario. The, the friends see Job and they think they know that Job did something and God is punishing him for some reason. And Job knows he didn't do anything wrong. And everybody in the situation thinks they have all of the pertinent information. What nobody in Job's situation realizes is that there's, Job 1 exists and there was this bet between God and Satan. We, as the readers, see this and know this is the background of what's going on. But as Job and his friends play out this literary drama in front of us, and we see them going back and forth and back and forth, we know that if they had just read Job 1, the whole thing might begin to make a little bit more sense. But they can't. They can't figure it out. It's... In terms of, of calculus or math, or when we were in, in school, right, you would have two sides of an equation. X equals or X plus three equals six. Figure out what X is. And you've got to balance both sides of the equation. The equation is God is just and good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. And what's the variable? What, how do we, what do we plug in to solve this problem? And so the book of Job is, is several men going round and round and round again. So I'm going to pick up in Job chapter 22 or 21, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 as we get started. It says, then Job spoke again. Listen closely to what I am saying. That's one consolation you can give me. Bear with me and let me speak. After I have spoken, you may resume mocking me. My complaint is with God, not with people. I have good reason to be so impatient. Look at me and be stunned. Put your hand over your mouth in shock. When I think about what I am saying, I shudder. My body trembles. This is a man who has gone back and forth and back and forth. We clearly see that Job's friends have hurt him. They've poured salt on his wound over and over and over again. My complaint is with God, he says in verse 4. He says, he says, look at me and be stunned. Have a care for what has just actually happened to me. Why won't you give it a rest? I've lost everything. I'm broken. I'm covered in boils. I've been scraping my body with pot sherds. I'm, I, my, my, I cut my hair off. My family's dead. Everything that I have ever built has been radically taken from me in the most violent of manner. Please, just listen and just have a little bit of compassion. He's angry here. He's angry and he's bitter. He's, he, he's got that, and we've all been there. We've all seen it happen, that bitter sarcasm, right? This angry, and it's not even just anger. It's anger and it's this hurt that's inside of us that lashes out to say things and be sarcastic and nasty and ugly in ways we never were normally would. Job here is just fed up. He's just fed up. He reveals, ultimately, that within this moment of absolute shame and sorrow, he's demanding and desiring that God defend himself. Why? Because his worldview says, God is just. Good things happen to people who do good things. Bad things happen to people who do bad things. I can't make this equation work. And it's bad enough when something terrible happens, but when it happens and you know you can't figure out what you did to make it happen, it makes it even worse. He needs God to explain how he can still be just and this could happen to him. This is a timeless book. I know it's set all the way back at the beginning of the Old Testament, but how many of us have heard some celebrity or somebody say, I can't believe in God. How could a God who's real let childhood cancer or abuse or all of these things exist? How can a good God allow any of this stuff to exist? This is exactly the question that Job is asking. I've been told God is just, and my life just blew up one day. It doesn't make any sense. Job and all of his friends assume that they have the critical information, that they have all of the pieces to this puzzle. They don't know 
that they're missing one of the most important pieces, and that is this whole debate between God, between God and Satan in, Genesis, in, in Job chapter 1. And the critical error that his friends make is they, they don't even question whether or not they know everything they need to know. We'll talk about this more later, but I don't have teenagers, but I have a child who's old enough to begin to think this, where you tell a child, no, don't do that. And their response is, well, you just don't want me to have any fun whatsoever. You're just a jerk. You're just mean. You're just trying to, to ruin my life and to not let me have any friends. They assume that because you said no, you want them to suffer. What they don't realize is you did that after your parents said no and you did sneak out and do the thing you're telling them not to do and then you have a bad memory or something terrible happened as a result of it or you had friends who did something. They think... You told me no, and I'm mad, therefore I have all the information I need to know to tell you that you are mean and bad. A child has no perspective on this situation, and so they just blow up and get angry the minute you tell them they're not supposed to do something. This is Job essentially speaking here, and his friends essentially saying, I know how the world works, and I know everything I need to know about your situation to tell you that you've done something wrong and you can't convince me otherwise. How arrogant, how hurtful is that? He goes on, and this is the long passage that I'm going to read tonight in Job chapter 21. I'm going to start in verse 7, and we're going to go all the way through 18. He says, why do the wicked prosper, growing old and powerful? They live to see their children grow up and settle down, and they enjoy their grandchildren. This is a man, the man who says this is a man who not a week or two before, had kids and just watched, was there when they all got wiped out. When I th their homes are safe from every fear and God does not punish them. Job got word that the house, a house was blown down and killed family members. Their bulls never fail to breed, and their cows bear calves and never miscarry. They let, children frisk. they let their children frisk about like lambs. Their little ones skip and dance. They sing with tambourine and harp. They celebrate with the sound of the flute. They spend their days in prosperity, then go down to the grave in peace. And yet they say to God, go away. We want no part of you and, our way, and your ways. Who is the Almighty, and why should we obey him? What good will it do us to pray? They think they're prosperity of their own doing, but I will have nothing to do with that kind of thinking. Yet, the light of the wicked never seems to be extinguished. Do they ever have trouble? Does God distribute so uh, sorrows to them in anger? Are they driven before the wind like straw? Are they carried away by the storm like chaff? Not at all. Job is simply saying here, I have been spending my entire life as a good and righteous man, following the rules, putting you first. And I have watched as my entire life has crumbled without any justification while I see men who actively op oppose the way of God, who actively live against the way of God, going about living their life without any fear. He's stomping his feet on the ground and says, that's not fair. And before we make Job feel bad, or before we, we point our fingers at him with another round of rebuke, we say the same thing when somebody else gets the promotion that we want at work. When we've stayed late and gone in early, and then that promotion comes clear, and the person who's buddies with the boss gets it instead of us, we stamp our feet and say, that's not fair. When we've worked twice as hard as somebody else, and everything seems to come up short for us, and we look at somebody else who's lazy, who doesn't work as hard, who doesn't do as much, and they seem to be living on easy street. We stomp our feet and say, that's not fair. We know, every one of us knows the situation that we can't help but realize that that's not fair. You see, the situation here is that... <clears throat> I'm going, to, I'm going to use some, some, some scientific terms. Some, I'm going to say it like this, and hopefully you, you get it. You get what I'm saying. The data of this situation is I've been righteous, 
and I followed all of God's commands, and my life has fallen apart. And the data of this situation, the content of this situation has run smack dab into his worldview that doing right gets you good results. And both of those things have slammed together like two cars getting T-boned, two cars slamming into each other, and both of these realities are being blown up in real time. His worldview is exploding under the pressure of what he is dealing with. The data of this situation violates his view of how the world ought to work, how it's supposed to work, how he thought it worked, and most importantly, how he thought God worked. God doesn't seem like quite as interesting, quite as just, quite as loving a God as he did a few weeks earlier. And he goes on in verse 19. I'm going to read verse 19 and then um, 19 to 21, and then we'll, we'll pause here because I think it's important to sit with this. He continues on, and, and Job now is sort of, um, he, he's, he's arguing with them. And basically, he said this. He says, God doesn't punish the wicked. And then he begins to anticipate their rebuttal. He's been through this process again and again. Again, as married couples, we know this. We know if we're going to say one thing, they're going to say something else. And so we begin to anticipate what they're going to say and cut them off ahead of time. He says, well, you say at least God will punish their children, but I say he should punish the ones who sin so that they understand his judgment. Let them see destruction with their own eyes. Let them drink deeply of the anger of the Lord Almighty, for they will not care what happens to their family after they are dead. Job's assumption here is even God's justice feels unjust. He's anticipating an argument where he says, well, well, we know that bad things happen to bad people, but he might take a generation or two for it to bear fruit. And Job's response is, no, 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 no. If somebody did something wrong, they're the ones who should bear the punishment, not their kids or their grandkids. And before we resolve this, because I, I, frankly, I hope this gets us a little bit uncomfortable we need to recognize the value of sitting in this emotional theological space. Here, Job is desperately trying to be heard. He just wants somebody to hear him in this horrible circumstance. He wants somebody who will shut up and listen. Listen to what he is going through. Listen to how he is feeling. Listen to what what he is trying to get out. And his friends, so-called friends, won't shut up. Job is trying to survive the worst possible situation. And his friends are needling him, trying to fix him. They're just trying to explain, Job, you did something. You need to admit you did something. And then, and then we can figure this out. They're just trying to get a res- re- to resolve their own discrepancy in their own. They're far more important. They're far more interested in their own understanding of his situation than him in that situation. And as Christians, I, I want to tell you this as somebody who has been a pastor, who has sat with people who have been crying at the, 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 in a funeral home or crying with the, the death of a child or crying in a, in, a, in a horrible lost moment. We want to fix them. We want to move them forward and bring a situation to resolution as quickly as possible. But that is not the compassionate thing to do. It's not compassionate to try to put them back together and move them ahead. It is selfish. The compassionate thing is to sit with them in their pain. When we try to put them back together, solve their problem, and push them ahead, all we're trying to do is make ourselves feel better. 
Job is just desperate for somebody to hear and respond to him, to match and accept his pain. And it is because of this this extended dispute that he he admits, we read it earlier, he says, put your hand over your mouth in shock. He says, just think about what happened to me and think about what that would do to you. Just have the tiniest little ounce of compassion. Just stop for a second before you make fun of me again. And it's because the friends continue not to. It's because they refuse to give Job the ability to sit in his suffering, in his pain, to experience it, that he begins to move to verses which are the most dangerous in all of the chapter. It's one thing, it's one thing to think to yourself, this situation, I can't see how this makes sense. It's another thing to recognize that there is a fundamental injustice in the world. But what Job says in verse 22 and, 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 and 22 through 33 is scary. He says this, but who can teach a lesson to God since he judges even the most powerful? One person dies in prosperity, completely comfortable and secure, the picture of good health, vigorous and fit. Another person dies in bitter poverty, never having tasted the good life, But both are buried in the same dust. Both are eaten by the same maggots. Look, I know what you're thinking. I know the schemes you plot against me. You will tell me of rich and wicked people whose houses have vanished because of their sins. But ask those who have been around and they will tell you the truth. Evil people are spared in times of calamity and are allowed to escape disaster. No one criticizes them openly or pays them back for what they have done. When they are carried to the grave, an honor guard keeps them at their tomb. A great funeral procession goes to the cemetery. Many pay their respects as the body is laid to rest, and the earth gives sweet repose. What is he saying here? What's the point? Why choose to live righteously? What's the point in trying to be a follower of this God? Who cares? Righteous or unrighteous, we all end up in the same ground being eaten by the same bugs. What does any of this matter? It doesn't matter is where he's going here. He's headed towards nihilism. Nihilism is the belief that because we all, uh, everybody dies, nothing really matters. Nothing matters at all. Power, fight for yourself, care about yourself, don't care about other people or, 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 or meeting some objective moral standard. This is a man who... As we've gone through this, I I want you to see, as we've gone through this chapter, what we have seen is Job walk the entire emotional journey from fresh pain. Look at me. Look at me. Look at what it is. Put your hand over your mouth. Pain to trying to figure out how how he can justify it. To being angry and bitter at friends who won't let him sit there. To, To the far extent where his pain is threatening to get so dark and overwhelming that it swallows all faith. In this one chapter alone, we see a man go from fresh wounds of sorrow to deep bitterness because nobody is willing to sit with him and let him experience what is going on. At the end of this chapter, we know how all of the story of Job um, ends up. God comes back and he he tells him, Job, that basically, I don't don't care if you don't think it's just, I get to make the rules and you have to play by them. And then God gives back Job double everything that he lost. We know that that's the end of the story. But part of the reason that I wanted to talk about Job 21 is Job 21 traces the emotional journey of trauma. The entire journey. From the moment of pain to trying to figure out how this makes sense. There is a moment when once the, the immediate sort of acute situation of the pain happens, then the moment you can come up for breath, you begin to try to figure out how this makes sense. What, what is this? What did I do to deserve this? How does this happen? And then you realize that you can't quantify it or qualify what's going on. And so you, then you get bitter. And if, if left unresolved, 
emotional trauma and pain and all of these things that happen, suffering unresolved ends in this place where nothing matters and goodness doesn't matter. Righteousness doesn't matter because we all die, so I might as well take what I can get while I'm here. This is what happens when we won't shut up and live with somebody in their pain. And it ends with Job's final declaration of sarcastic, angry response. How can your empty cliches comfort me? All your explanations are lies. If you are ever in a receiving line for somebody who's had a parent die, don't ever tell them they're in a better place. Just don't. Don't tell them that an angel needed new wings or calm, theologically incorrect platitudes. Somebody who's lost a loved one doesn't need you to chuck a sarcastic cliche in their direction to make yourself feel a little bit better. Job 21, and this is why it's so philosophical. It is told in such a way as to trace the entire emotional journey of trauma. But it's not just that. I'm going to end tonight with a couple of points that we can take away from Job, this chapter particularly, but all of Job. Because Job is a part of the Bible. It has to be seen in the light of the Bible. The first thing I want to say is this. The suffering of the righteous is real. Job tells us, shows us that righteousness is not an automatic get out of free card, get out of suffering free card. As much as Proverbs tells us truly that good decisions typically lead to good results, there are times when you can do all of the right things and everything can fall apart. And I'll go one thing further. It is Job, which is one of the most important places in the Old Testament, to set up to lay the groundwork for Jesus. Job was a righteous man who did nothing wrong, and his he he's everything fell apart. Job sets a theological groundwork for the simple fact that in 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 the in in God, in God's plan, in God's desires, and how God works is there are times when the righteous suffers irrespective of whether or not they deserve it, which is the exact situation of Jesus. Jesus is far more righteous than even Job was, and yet Jesus dies a far more vicious death than Job ever did. Jesus suffers on behalf of the entire world that deserved to suffer. The book of Job shows us in an absolutely unvarnished truth that There are times when those who are righteous get a horrible result and those who are unrighteous, everything's fine with them. And that is the the radical and strange truth of the gospel. Jesus deserved none of what he got. We deserved everything that he did get. And yet Jesus, from the very beginning of the world, set out, began the process. The entire journey of the Bible is the process leading up to this place where Jesus, the righteous, the most righteous man in the world, took our pain and suffering. I'm not saying Job is some sort of pre-incarnate version of Jesus. What I'm saying is Job tells us that the righteous can suffer and, in fact, do suffer. And Job lays the groundwork to help us understand how that can happen for Jesus. Second thing I want to say is this. Just because something happens to you doesn't mean you did anything to deserve it. We don't deserve all of the trauma and pain that happens to us. Nor do we deserve all the good things that happen to us. The book of Job teaches us that you cannot judge the things that happen in our lives purely on the basis of what we did and didn't deserve. You can't calculate your life like that. 
So when everything falls apart, you cannot, it is, uh, it, is, it is incorrect to assume that you did everything wrong and that this is just God throwing down on you because you did something wrong. And when things go well, it's not simply, it is not right or correct to simply assume that, well, God's happy with you and so he's blessing you. Every good thing that happens to you doesn't happen because you're some awesome person. And everything bad that happens to you doesn't happen because you're some terrible person. Things happen. The great irony of the book of Job is, 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 is God and Satan begin the story by having this bet about what Job will really do when everything is taken from him. And it ends without God doing what we would expect him to do. We would expect God to come down and sort of say, well, sorry, Job, but Satan and I had this wager and we were, we were trying to figure out what you would do. God does not tell Job this. Job never learns, as Pastor Steve said this on Sunday, never learns about what happened in heaven. And the reason is that the point of the book is that things happen and we will never know the full story. We will never know the full story. We will never know the entire story of why certain things happened to us, good or bad, and we will certainly never know the full story of what happens to other people. Things happen. This world, this world is filled with situations where the, those who, who should be punished are not, and those who are punished are those who shouldn't. That just happens in this world. And the third thing, and I think this is important for us Christians, Job gives voice to our incentives of injustice. Job teaches us and shows us that when something happens that just doesn't make sense, it is okay to cry out in pain. It is okay to question. It is okay to recognize that it doesn't make any sense. As Christians, we are not commanded or expected to stoically and simply and unapologetically accept everything that happens to us. When our world falls apart, when something happens and we cannot justify it. We have no idea how to integrate it. It is not sin to cry out to God about seeming injustice in our lives. Job did not sin. Even in these moments where he questioned God's justice, he did not sin. It's not a sin to recognize that things are happening and you don't know how to solve the equation and it seems really, really bad. It is okay for us as Christians to recognize the pain in our lives and to let the pain that people are experiencing around us, to let them be in that and to walk through that with them. But what Job does is provide caution to us about our limited perspective. Job is demanding that God justify himself because he wants to know how God has made it just. Job doesn't understand what happened in Job 1. More importantly, his friends assume that they know everything they need to know about Job's situation to label and describe and define him. Job's friends have this tiny little window into his life. They see a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of what's really going on. And yet they are arrogant enough to think they have every bit of information they need to have to describe, define, and, and, and label exactly what Job is going through. The reason why Job's friends sinned and they are supposed to ask Job for forgiveness and Job is supposed to offer a sacrifice on their behalf is they are arrogant enough to think that whatever information they have is the only information they have and the only information there is and the only information they need. Job himself is the echo of our own suffering. When we read Job, we can hear echoes of our own suffering in our own life. And Job is also a cautionary tale to have a little bit of grace and humility with the people in our lives who are going through suffering. It is so easy for us to see somebody, know one or two pieces of information about them, and think we know everything we need to know to label them a bad person or a bad decision maker. It is so easy for us to get arrogant, to know that, think we know everything we need to know to define somebody. We will never know everything. 
And although we think we might have a good perspective, we will always be missing a potentially essential clue to what's going on. Things happen in this world. Horrible things happen, and there is no easy explanation for why. Job asks the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer of Job is, nobody knows. Because there's not a simple answer. You can't explain it away. In some ways, that's an incredibly unsatisfying answer because we want to end the story by wrapping it up and tying a bow on it and putting it on a shelf. This is the answer. But life is far too complicated for that. And so we have to leave it there. Job is forced, as we are forced, to say, I don't know how it all works out. But despite it all, I will cling to the justice of God and trust that he is good even when it looks and feels like he's not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Job. Thank you that you have given us a book that echoes our deepest sorrow and our worst pain. Thank you that Job gives voice to our deepest sense of injustices in this world. Thank you that you have given us the ability and the grace and the space to feel the most horrible moments and not have to stoically accept them. I pray that as we continue on in our study of, of, of the Bible and as we read on that, that the lesson of Job, the suffering of the righteous person, the, the, the pain that is inevitable in the life of every believer, doesn't, this lesson doesn't leave and that we see it pop up again and again and again and it gives us the courage and the joy and the ability to not only continue and maintain our faith when we are dealing with it, but to walk with other people as they are trying to come to terms and deal with these exact same moments in their life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.